And now we come to curiosity, the vice of curiosity. The sin of Eve started with curiosity. It's all in there, in, the, in Genesis. She saw the for forbidden fruit as beautiful and desirable. She was attracted to it. And then they both ate. So there was a curiosity in it. The curiosity was the beginning of it. It was not the essence of the sin, but it was the beginning of it. And had she not been curious, she would not have fallen. So there's a vice of curiosity. And in so doing, they brought ab about the deluge of evils upon the world. <clears throat> All of the propensity for sin in the world is due to that original sin of disobedience that Adam and Eve committed, which started in curiosity. So in our spiritual lives, we may have a curiosity of the eyes, of the ears, of the hands and feet, of the mind, of the memory, of the will, or of the heart. And these produce great evils. Now, what is curiosity? <clears throat> there is a legitimate curiosity, and then there's a vice of curiosity. The vice of curiosity is to want to know things or experience things uh, that do not pertain to you or are in some way evil. Good curiosity is to want to know more primarily about God, but even about natural things that pertain to you. But always to know more about God and to, to read about God, to, to contemplate, etc. That, that, because that obviously pertains to you. But curiosity is that drive to know something or in some way to be involved with something that doesn't pertain to you. That's the vice of curiosity. And from this vice of curiosity, all other vices can flow. All other sins can flow. All excesses, all crimes can flow from it. <clears throat> Through curiosity, we seek to experience forbidden pleasure. So very often, there, in, in, with regard to impurity, there's something called sinful curiosity. And that is where you see something that is quite possibly sinful, but you get curious about it. And many times people fall into grave sins because of that curiosity. In other words, not turning the page when you see something improper. Now, sinful curiosity with regard to that is venial in itself, but it easily is the door to mortal sin. It easily slides into mortal sin. Also from curiosity come all heresies. The curious reformers, or so-called reformers, of, of the Catholic religion want to scrutinize beyond their ability to know. And this research of curiosity ends up in heresy. St. Augustine said, curiositas invenit heresim. Curiosity finds heresy. Again, it is to try to know something that is beyond you, either beyond your intellectual ability or beyond the ability of the thing to be known. So heresies spring up because people just uh, 
don't know enough about the Catholic faith and they explain it in some erroneous way and then become attached to their erroneous ideas. Or they are trying to, to learn something or figure out something which is by nature beyond human intelligence, even angelic intelligence. And so they make mistakes about the incarnation, about grace, about all sorts of other supernatural mysteries, original sin, etc. Things that are in the mind of God that are not even understood by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Comprehended. In other words, totally understood. Or the highest angel. Things that only God knows. The Trinity, the relations between the persons, etc. There are certain things that we will never understand. Even in the beatific vision, we will not totally understand them. So that's where curiosity comes. St. Nihilus said, Do not seek to discover the mysteries of God. It is sufficient for you to believe and adore. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to theologize. And it just means if something is beyond you, leave it alone. That's what St. Augustine said about grace and free will. He said, if you don't want to fall into error, don't ask. In other words, it is something that is beyond human understanding how grace and free will work together. We know that they do, but how, we don't know. In, uh, in Proverbs, chapter 27, verse 20, hell and, and destruction are never filled, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. Curiosity is a devouring fire. It is a bottomless pit which is never filled. St. Augustine said that the curious man wants to know that which does not concern him and that the wise man is concerned only with his own affairs. So curiosity is the source of gossip, detraction, calumny, worldliness, being concerned and worried about totally useless worldly things, what people think, what people say. And, and it corrodes the spiritual life. That's why monasticism exists, to keep your mind on God and the things of God. In Ecclesiasticus it says, For it is not necessary for thee to see with thine eyes those things that are hid. <clears throat> and this means that in unnecessary matters we should not be over-curious. And inquisitive about the works of God excessively inquisitive about the works of God. Um, <clears throat> so, so we should put aside vain things uh, uh, that is, uh, useless things of which you have no need. In other words, anything that pertains to, that doesn't pertain to you. It, curiosity is about things that are not your business. And these things are a waste of time and a waste of your minds and a waste of your efforts. St. Gregory said, 
Curiosity is a serious vice which leads the mind to examine the lives of other people. It hides those things which are interior to us, obviously because we're concerned about things around us and we don't look inside, so that in knowing the business of others, he says, we are ignorant of ourselves. The more the curious man is apt to know the merits of others, to that same degree he is ignorant of his own qualities. So as he pays more attention to what other people are doing and thinking and saying, and uh, he is missing the most important thing, which is his own qualities or defects. What we must know is the will and the law of God. We must know religion, virtue, and our duties. But we neglect often this knowledge. And on the other hand, we pay attention to what we should ignore, namely vice, the world, and all worldly things, the, the business of other people. But curiosity draws us to know these things, these things that, that have, have no use for us. In the book of Proverbs it says, For he that is a searcher of majesty shall be overwhelmed by glory. And the sense is that he who seeks to know the secrets of God is the same as seeking error and heresy. By analogy, he that looks directly at the sun will be blinded. So the vice of curiosity in theological things easily leads to heresy because you cannot penetrate totally the things of God and if you try to penetrate something that you cannot see, ultimately, you're going to make errors about it. You're describing something that you cannot see. So you're almost certainly going to make errors. So there is always a sense of mystery in the things of God. There are things that we do not understand about God and his ways. In Ecclesiasticus it says, Seek not the things that are too high for thee, and search not into things above thy ability, but the things that God hath commanded thee, think on them always, and in many of his works be not curious. That's chapter 3, verse 22 of Ecclesiasticus. St. Augustine said, Let us admit that God can do something which we are not able to investigate. <laughs> it was in one of his, his discussions with many people. <laughs> I don't know what it was referring to, but very possibly predestination and grace. See, let us admit... God can do something which we are not able to investigate. <laughs> Imprudent curiosity leads to error. The philosophers made these errors. They made many mistakes about religion and virtue. they concocted many inappropriate, false, dangerous, and erroneous ideas. Even Plato in his Republic has some really bizarre ideas. Calling themselves wise, they became fools. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 22, which we cited in De Revelazione, for professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. St. Prosper of Aquitaine said, who was the interpreter of St. Augustine, 
and his, after St. Augustine died, he was the, his champion, you might say, against the, the Pelagians, St. Prosper. He said, without the sun, the earth is only darkness. Likewise, everything that we want to know only by the forces of nature, with the help only of reason, and not with the help of revelation concerning God, man, and his duties, is only darkness and obscurity. True doctrine, he says, in these matters can only be explained by God himself. St. Paul says, from which things, this is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, and I think we did this this morning, from which things some going astray are turned aside into vain babbling, during uh, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither the things they say nor whereof they affirm. Internet theologians. And he says, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and vain. It's also from First Timothy. All right. So that's curiosity. Next we go on to the subject of the devil. There are wicked spirits which we call demons or devils. Sacred scripture attests to their existence and all nations have unanimously recognized their existence. The pagan nations believed in the existence of certain spirits, some good and some evil. They concluded that it was necessary to obtain the affection of the good spirits by paying respects and by making offerings and by prayers. And it was also necessary to appease the malice of the evil spirits. So there were horrible rites instituted in order to appease the malice of the evil spirits. The Aztec rites, for example, by uh, killing their enemies and offering people on those pyramids and flaying them and, and eating all of that. That was the, 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 you can see it in the, they, they had that serpent god, that, that's that big disc. Those were considered semi civilized people. Uh, but uh, the human race has descended into ab absolutely horrifying um, practices and beliefs because of that, uh, of that essentially devil worship. Uh, the American Indians were going to celebrate the feast of the North American martyrs. I mean, they, they were uh, always, it was a, a religion of demons, you know, and, and, uh, and a great deal of it was uh, pleasing the evil demons so that they don't do anything wrong or bad to you. <clears throat> so from this corruption of the human mind uh, came idolatry. See, the idols represented these demons. Polytheism, superstitions, magic, divination, all of those things have a relationship to devils in one way or the other. Pagan philosophers also believed in these things. Revelation has enlightened us in regarding the existence of demons. Moses teaches us that the first woman was led to disobey God by a perfidious enemy hidden under the form of a serpent. So this is in Genesis. He also says in Deuteronomy that the Israelites immolated their children 
to wicked and malicious spirits. That's chapter 32, verse 17. And that was the immolation of the children to Moloch. They would take their babies and uh, kill them and then burn them uh, in, in the, the, like a little cradle in the idol of Moloch. This is on their way to the promised land. And you know Solomon permitted the, um, the, the worship of the false gods, in, 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 of course. And then the um, Akaz, uh, Isaiah, uh, reproached him for uh, taking the Syrian gods in Israel so that the Syrians wouldn't overcome them. So let's worship the Syrian gods so that, that we won't be overcome by the Syrians. And he was blasted by Isaiah and, and uh, so that's the prophet Isaiah. So, uh, and in Psalm 105, verse 37, it says, Imula verun filios suos et filias suas demoniis. They have immolated their sons and their daughters to demons. So our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of the existence of demons and he expelled them from the bodies of the possessed. That's mentioned many times in sacred scripture. The apostles also spoke to us about the same thing and the existence of devils therefore is a dogma of the Catholic Church. Demon means uh, from the Greek, it means uh, a spirit, uh, a genius, or an intelligence. Diabolos means the adversary. And so the word devil comes from that. Diable in French. And it makes its way up through various changes into devil. So consequently, this word, which signifies a being gifted with knowledge, has nothing odious in itself. In other words, the word demon in itself does not connote evil. In the New Testament, the word demon, daimon, is always taken in a bad sense, however. It signifies a wicked spirit, enemy of God and men. At the beginning of creation, God created the angels from nothing. And he made them good. Sacred scripture tells us that many among the angels revolted against their creator. And there's discussion about the motive. Uh, <clears throat> and they were punished by a condemnation to eternal torment. Many theologians say that they revolted, uh, and this is Suarez and uh, I think some fathers even, um, that they revolted because of the incarnation, that God revealed to them the incarnation uh, and uh, uh, they would not worship our Lord. Uh, the Thomas, however, disagree. <laughs> the, the, uh, they say that the, uh, the sin of Satan was to desire for himself the same majesty and power and glory that God had, that he was too intelligent to know that he could be God, but he was jealous of God. That is, his power, his authority, his glory, and wanted that for himself. So it was an envy. Which seems to make more sense because that's exactly how he tempted Adam and Eve was, ye shall be like, like gods. You, you will have this authority, this power, this independence, etc., that God has. That's what, that's, so it was envy. 
Remember I told you I didn't remember the name? What was I saying? That the handle, the, oh, we'll play it now, but the handle uh, oratorio, the, the envy is the eldest child of hell, eldest born of hell. That's true. That that was there was an envy about God's majesty and glory. After I'm off camera, I'll play it for you. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, but there's, you know, discussion about exactly what the sin was, but it was certainly a sin of pride. Sacred Scripture calls them demons. The other angels who remained faithful were confirmed in grace by God. According to their nature, angels are intelligent spirits, active, immortal, completely spiritual, having no matter whatsoever, and destined by God to live and to nourish themselves by pure contemplation. Beatific vision. Angels are creatures which come closest to the divine majesty. So the, the highest angel, and by tradition that was Lucifer, or is the, the angel closest to the divine essence is the highest angel, but yet the closest creature, no matter how great he is, is infinitely inferior to God. But there is a hierarchy of perfection in the angels, just as there's a hierarchy of perfection in creation. A, a rose bush is better than a weed. Why rose bushes don't grow like weeds, I will never figure out. It would be very nice if they did. Or why weeds don't look like rose bushes. <laughs> you have to think about that. The, in other words, there's a hierarchy in creation among the animals, uh, every, uh, there's a hierarchy. So also in the angels, there's a hierarchy. So it's sort of like an upside down triangle. In other words, that the, the highest angel is at the top and then they come down in, in just the perfections of their nature down to the lowest angel. And that's, that's where you get the nine choirs of angels. <clears throat> so the highest angel is a higher creature than the Blessed Virgin Mary by nature, but not by dignity. Or grace. That's why she has the title of Queen of Angels. So, <clears throat> so they were made to uh, form his court. By falling, the rebel angels lost nothing of their nature, nothing of their vast intelligence of their agility or of their spirituality. They lost only their beauty, their innocence, and their happiness. So they are still very powerful creatures. I think I may have told you that one famous author, and I forget who it was, said if they had bodies, they would be like the sun. That's how big they are and powerful they are. That's who you're dealing with in a temptation. <laughs> Somebody with that kind of power. St. Right. <clears throat> Augustine tells us what became of them. He says, The devil is the teacher of lies, the enemy of the human race, the inventor of death, the teacher of pride, the head of crime, the prince of all vices, the instigator of filthy pleasures. In another place, he says, what is more depraved, what is more malignant, what is more wicked than our enemy? Referring to the devil. Our Lord and the apostles attribute to devils the greatest crimes, the unbelief of the Jews, the treason of Judas, the blindness of the pagans, 
cruel diseases, possessions, and obsessions. They call Satan the father of lies, the prince of this world, the ancient serpent, and the devil, meaning the adversary, Diabolus. <clears throat> 